Uh, welcome to The Mind Report. I am Laurie Santos. I'm professor of psychology at Yale University, and today I'm talking with... I'm Tali Sharat, and I'm a neuroscientist at University College London, and I study how emotion and motivation affects decision-making. Well, and so today we're going to be talking about some of Tali's cool new work, uh, looking at the neural basis of our human optimism um, and when optimism can lead us astray. Uh, for those that don't know, Tali has written a fantastic book. I'll come plug it. This is the optimism bias, uh, why we're wired to look on the bright side. Um, she also has a new TED talk and a cool new TED ebook um, if you want other versions of Tali's stuff. Um, but I think this stuff is, is pretty cool because it gets at what I think of as a sort of fundamental human tendency to kind of think about the future and sometimes be a little bit overconfident about it. Um, so just to get us started, so Tali, tell us a little bit about what this uh, optimism bias is and why it's so interesting. So the optimism bias was first shown by um, a social psychologist named Neil Weinstein in 1980. And what he did, he asked students actually in the university to say how likely they were to have a whole bunch of positive events happening to them and negative events happening to them relative to other students. So for example, are you more or less likely to get cancer? Are you more or less likely to get divorced than other students? Are you more or less likely to win an award? And what he found was that, that over and over again, the students would say they were more likely to have all these positive events happening to them, more likely to have a gifted kid, more likely to be um, professionally successful, mm -hmm. and they were less likely than other individuals in the university to have negative events happening to them, um, such as divorce, for example, or any kind of uh, medical condition. Mm -hmm. So um, that is basically the optimism bias, our tendency to overestimate the likelihood of positive events, underestimate the likelihood of negative events. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's also about how you think about yourself. So not only about the future, optimism talks about the future, but also when people look at themselves, they tend to be overconfident and they tend to have what we call a superiority illusion. So mm -hmm. they think they're better than other people, um, better than what they actually are. So kind of have a relatively rosy view. Got it. And so what got you interested in this in the first place? Because it's in some ways a funny thing for psychologists to study, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, it was a total accident. Mm -hmm. um, I was interested in how um, emotion changes memory, mm -hmm. specifically negative emotions, traumatic events. We had some studies on 9-11 at the time. Um, and then in 2006, um, I did a study looking at how people imagine the future. Mm -hmm. because um, it's been shown that the same systems in the brain that are involved in remembering the past are also involved in imagining the future, including, for example, the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know whether the same way that traumatic um, events, negative emotions, affects our memory, is it the same way that it affects the way that you imagine the future? So I asked my students, um, my participants in my study, to imagine different negative events in the future, and I wanted to compare those to neutral events, like mm -hmm. getting an ID card or having your hair cut. Um, but over and over again, what the participants did, they, they made it, like, twisted the events, so they became quite positive. So getting a hair haircut became going to get a haircut and donate my hair to Lux of Love, which is a charity, and then I'm going to go and celebrate. And even negative events, the end of a romantic relationship, people would say, well, you know, um, I then started a new relationship, which was much better. So they had this positive twist and everything. And I was quite annoyed because I didn't want to say that. <laughs> so I was like, no, please think about <laughs> The negative events stuff. and neutral events. Right. But now they would think about positive. And then I, after a while, I thought, well, this is quite interesting. Um, if, you know, 80 or 90 percent of the subjects do this, um, mm -hmm. there must be a reason. And I started looking into that. And then I found all this literature and social psychology about optimism. Um, and so I started just studying optimism. And there wasn't a lot about um, cognitive processes and um, biological processes that can explain optimism. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a very interesting field for me. And so you're already seeing, because it seems like that bias to think positively about future events seems to differ from how we think about past events, right? Because there seems to be even more of a negative bias for thinking about the past. Is that... Uh... Yeah. When you think about the past, it depends. The studies are mixed. So some, some studies show a negative bias, some a positive. I would say, on average, um, we remember emotion, emotional events, salient events. So what's important is whether it's emotional. Mm -hmm very positive events, like your wedding or birth of a kid, and very negative events, um, such as an accident, for example. Um, the past is somewhat constrained. So it's a little bit, we, we do tend to change our memories, but it's more constrained. The future is unconstrained. 
it's mm -hmm. open to interpretation. Um, and therefore, it's more easy for us to imagine different things because in principle, anything might happen. So yeah. It is possible. And the other thing that I find is that people remember negative events. So they would remember failing in an exam or, or you know, a relationship that didn't work out. But what they do, they try and find the lesson out of it. So they're like, mm -hmm. I failed the exam because I didn't study enough. Next time I will study more. And so I will get a good grade. Mm -hmm. So these kind of negative memories actually make them more optimistic, not less. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. So, um, So then one question that arises is like, it seems like a lot of people in your studies are doing this, like before you said like 80 or 90% of people are showing these. I mean, is this a universal trait to kind of think positively about the future or do we see variation? I mean. Um, it seems so. So um, we see it in males, we see it in females, um, we see it in different ages. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, some studies coming out which shows that um, a, everyone does it. If you're a kid, if you're middle age, if you're 80 years old, everyone has this bias. But um, it's um, a sort of um, a U shape where people actually are more optimistic, where they're kind of very young. Mm -hmm. And actually, so let me just go back for a minute. Mm -hmm. So what we do is um, we look at how people, maybe I should talk about this later because it's learning about bad news and good news. Um, well, tell, tell, so I guess tell me a little bit about how you study the optimism bias. How do you ask people? Yeah, um, yeah how do I study? <laughs> so um, there's many ways to study um, optimism and the optimism bias. Um, optimism, it's, it's important to actually kind of define the different terms. So optimism is um, having positive expectations of the future. Mm -hmm. um, hope is um, the need or the the want that these events will happen. Um, and the optimism bias is a difference between what we expect and the outcome. I see. So you could actually expect negative things to happen. So you might expect your um, stocks to go down, but if they go down more, that's actually still an optimism bias. Gotcha. So it's relatively for scientists easier to study because I can record people's expectations and then I can look at outcomes and I can compare the two. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that we were really interested in is how people maintain these positive expectations of the future because you get all this information um, from you know the world around you and you get information about yourself and what's likely to happen. So how is it that in face of these evidence, you still have these positive expectations? You know, you know the divorce rates are 50%. Mm -hmm. You know that your relationships failed in the past. Um, you know that the market, financial market, for example, is going down. So why do you expect still um, all these positive things? And so to test this, what we did is we asked people to estimate the likelihood of all sorts of negative events happening to them. Mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, robbery, and then we gave them information about the likelihood of these events. So the likelihood of Alzheimer's, for example, um, is 10%, let's mm -hmm. say, the likelihood of robbery is 15%. And then we asked them again, what is the likelihood of you um, encountering all these negative events? And what we find is, is that if we give people information that's better than what they expected, they take that information into account, they change their beliefs, um, and now they're even more optimistic. Mm -hmm. But if the information that we give them is worse than what they expected, so let's say you say, oh, my likelihood of, of cancer is about 10%, and we tell you the average likelihood for someone like you is 30%, then you kind of disregard it. You say, oh, that's not me. I'm healthy. I might, you know, I exercise. I eat well. It's unrelated to me. But if I tell you, um, oh, your likelihood of cancer is actually lower than what you think, you'd be like, oh. So that takes it. So that's um, neat. So that suggests we have learning mechanisms to update our expectations, but we only learn in the in one direction. We only learn about information of like, actually, my life is going to be even better than I thought, but we don't take into account negative information. And I think, I think maybe you only learn, that's a bit, um, mm -hmm. we learn from positive and we learn from negative, but we learn more from the positive than the negative. So at the end of the day, we have this bias. Mm -hmm. um, and this is... In, in some ways, you can think about it as a tendency to discount bad news. Mm -hmm. so you get this bad news, you know, and you, you see it, you know, in financial domains a lot. Um, you have people are telling you, oh, these, these investments are risky or, you know, the market is not good. And people are kind of not taking that into account, not looking at the bad news. Mm -hmm. And so, again, what we find is that this is even more extreme in a uh, young age and in very old age. So when you're young from about 10 years old, um, 
you don't learn from bad news as well as good news. And then as time goes by, you, you learn from bad news better and better and better. And then around 40 is where you actually peak. Mm-hmm. And you learn really well from bad news, still not as good as from good news. Mm-hmm. It starts going down as we age. Again, we kind of discount bad news even more. Um, so we see it um, across age, but um, there's these differences. Is there an optimal level of optimism? So I guess that gets to the question of is, is, it, is it a good thing or a bad thing to be optimistic? So what are some of the downsides of this optimism bias? Um, so they, there's good things and bad things about optimism. Um, the bad sides of it is that because you expect everything to be okay, you might not take precautionary action, mm-hmm. right? healthy, I don't need to go to the doctor, um, I'm not going to uh, buy insurance because it's going to be um, So these are the negative elements. The positive elements are that it, it acts as a motivation. Mm-hmm. We think we're going to get ahead at our job, you know, we're going to get that award, we're going to get that promotion, uh, we're going to find that relationship that we want, then we're going to put more effort into it. Mm-hmm. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because then you're more likely to actually have these things. Um, it also reduces our stress and anxiety, so that's very good for our health. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been shown that optimists tend to be healthier, uh, even if um, if you look at people, um, you know, um, who, patients like cancer patients, age patients, cardiac arrest patients. Mm-hmm. Even at the beginning, after whatever an operation or something, their health is the same. The optimist one, their health will um, become better quicker mm-hmm. than this one. And is that strange? Because wouldn't you think that being accurate would be the best strategy? I mean, just sort of thinking evolutionarily, right? Like if natural selection built in mechanisms to be really accurate, wouldn't that kind of en masse do better than kind of being overly optimistic or kind of putting resources into things that aren't going to pay off kind of thing? Um, so first of all, it's important to say that it's not that the more optimism that you have, the better. No. So yeah. So, so the optimal, optimal level for optimism is a mild optimism, mm-hmm. which the most population has a mild optimism, not an extreme sort of optimism, which is actually not optimal. So, for example, studies by behavioral economists um, um, show that extreme optimists are actually more likely to smoke. Um, they don't have good investments, good mm-hmm. performance, while the mild optimists are less likely to smoke than both the pessimists and the extreme optimists. Now, once you look at people who are more accurate, mm-hmm tend to be uh, mildly depressed individuals. Huh. So accuracy actually goes with being, um, in some sense, who are not optimistic at all or very pessimistic, perhaps. Or I guess they're, they're accurate, but... Once you get into severe depression, then you get into a pessimistic bias. Mm-hmm. Um, so if in, in individuals where they're, they don't have a bias, I guess um, accuracy is not necessarily the correct words, but um, there's two things going on. First, the mildly depressed individuals tend to learn the same from good news and bad news. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. they are more likely to have an accurate view, but they also are more likely to have a less biased view. So they might, um, the way that they overestimate uh, positive events and underestimate negative events kind of balance out. Mm-hmm. If not accurate, they're more balanced um, at the end of the day. And, you know, depression, even mild depression, is not a good thing. Um, so it's something that we don't want. So we do find that the mentally healthy individuals have at least a mild optimism. And so one of the things you've been looking at is to try to get some insight into how these biases come, come about from a neural perspective, right? Like trying to understand the neural mechanisms in terms of like, how do, how do we learn only certain kinds of information or learn certain kinds of information better than others? And so what have you guys found out so far about how this optimism bias plays out in terms of how we learn and how we uh, set up expectations? Um, so first of all, it seems from all the studies that we do that there's probably somewhat distinct systems that are involved in learning from, from good things and bad things. Mm-hmm. Um, they develop throughout life at a different rate. Huh. Um, they're affected differently by different pharmacological manipulations, example, um, by different uh, ways that we interfere with brain fat function, like using uh, TMS, um, and many different, basically any manipulation that we do um, does not necessarily affect the way that you learn from good news and bad news the same. So it seems mm-hmm. like to some extent. Mm-hmm. And our uh, some of our neuroimaging studies show that when you get um, good news, 
the um, parts of your frontal lobes track these good news. Um, the way that, that they do it is the brain actually um, tracks the difference between what you expect or what you believe and the new information. Mm -hmm. right? The further these two are apart, the more activity we see in the brain. And the brain actually learns from these differences. Uh, we call it estimation error. So you have your estimate and then and the information and the error is the difference between them. Mm -hmm. it's good information, when it's a good estimation error, the brain is tracking it really well. So we see that in the frontal lobes, uh, specifically in a region called the inferior frontal gyrus. Uh, but some other regions in the frontal lobe as well. And when it comes to bad news, the brain is not tracking these errors uh, as well. Um, and that's related to how much then you would change your beliefs. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if I tell you, uh, Lori, you know, no one's going to watch this blog um, and just a waste of time, your frontal lobes are not going to, and you think, oh, it, it will. Mm -hmm. So much and it's not going to change your beliefs but if i tell you you know i think that about a million people are going to watch this your frontal lobes will go hmm interesting and will code this kind of surprise um, and that surprise would change your beliefs and if i ask you later you know how many people are going to watch that you'll say hmm, maybe maybe close to a million um so that's what we see in in the brain and, and does this track with, with the differences we see in mildly depressed individuals do these different regions process information differently Exactly, exactly. So in mildly depressed individuals, um, and, you know, even more more depressed, we find that there's no differences. Mm -hmm. So mildly depressed individuals will, will track both positive information and negative information, and the difference between your expectation and the information, in a similar manner. Mm -hmm. And at the day, they will alter their beliefs in a similar manner in response to learning that, you know, the blog will be shown by a million people or by zero people. Um, and the more depressed you are, then it starts to shift in which you learn more from the negative, your brain is processing the negative more, and, and so on. And so just because I do work with animals, do we know anything about these kinds of biases playing out in animals? I mean, in theory, animals have these expectation prediction errors, right? So do we know whether they, too, have an optimism bias? Or... Uh, we don't know enough, for sure. Uh -huh. There's a few studies. It's It's a start. Um, so there are studies in birds and there's a um, very different approach because obviously you can't ask birds, you know, um, are you, do you think you're going to live a healthy life? Mm -hmm. Is your relationship going to work? So you have to come up with very sophisticated methods as you know. Um, so what they've done um, is to teach the animals. Um, so um, it, w it works like that. Both the birds and the rats is about the same. So they have, um, uh, for example, a black box, and they, they teach the birds that every time you see the oh, – let's do the auditory one. Oh, sorry. Starting. So okay. in the bird, what they do, they have a short auditory tone, um, and when they teach the birds, when they he hear the short auditory tone, they would get an immediate reward, a food reward. So this is a positive outcome for the birds. Um, and then they teach them that when they hear a long auditory tone, for example, they would get the reward, but only after a delay. Um, so that's a relatively negative outcome for the birds because they don't like to wait for their food. Um, so then they give them a medium um, auditory tone between the short and the long. And the question is, what are they going to do? So in order to get the reward, they always have to press the levers. If they hear the short auditory tone, they have to press the right lever and then they get the reward. If they hear the long one, they press the long, the left lever, and then they get the reward, but after a delay. So what are they going to do when they hear the medium one? Will they press the right, suggesting that they expect a positive outcome, or the left, suggesting that they expect a negative outcome? Um, and what they find is that most of the animals uh, tend to press the lever, suggesting that they expect the positive outcome. Now, they have a motivation to get it right, because if they don't get it right, they don't get anything at all. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you then extend the medium to be closer to the long auditory tone, closer to the one that predicts a negative outcome, a, you know, the, the reward after delay, they still press the one that suggests that they expect the outcome to come um, earlier on. Um, so that's a little bit of evidence um, to show that they have this optimism bias. What's very interesting in both of these studies is they only see the bias if the animals are kept in nice cages um, with lots of water and toys. Once they put them in small cages without uh, water and without toys, well, some water but not enough, and, and toys, then they don't show the bias anymore. They show more of a balanced expectations, a little bit like the mild depressed 
humans. Huh. So it suggests that maybe something about living in a slightly enriched environment is the kind of thing that gives us the basis of having an optimism expectation, like e e full stop, perhaps even in humans too. Yeah, so what we found uh, recently is that um, if you stress people out, the bias in how they process information goes away. So mm -hmm. this, this may be what's happening in the animals, you know, you put mm -hmm. them small cage, their stress, the bias goes away. This might be what's happening in depressed individuals because we know that depression is related to some genetic predisposition, but also to stressful life events. And when the two come together, that's when you show your depression symptoms. And what we find is, yes, if you stress individuals, their bias of information processing goes away. They now learn from positive and negative the same. And this may, one speculation is, will then come a negative view of the world, if I learn from, you know, the negative as well as the positive, I might then have more of a negative view of the world, which then might um, induce depression symptoms like, you know, a negative affect, um, low motivation. Mm -hmm. So some of these kinds of mechanisms could turn into sort of self-fulfilling prophecies in some interesting ways, right? Where you get a bias in how you process the information and that feeds forward in terms of like how you react and what you do. Right, because again, if you think, oh, this blog is not going to be very interesting and not a lot of people are going to watch it, you're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's super cool. I mean, so you've done some other work, too, kind of picking up on this theme of how you change your expectations and sort of change your processing over time, um, looking at how taking action and how making decisions can change your preferences, too, which is some of my favorite work that you've been up to recently. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about some of the kinds of things that can change our, our expectations and our even our preferences down the line? Um, yeah, so that work looks at how making a choice changes what you like. Um, so, for example, let's say you're debating between a job in London and a job in Paris, and they both seem really great, and you don't know what to choose, um, but you have to make a choice. So, finally, you choose a London one. The moment you make that decision, what we tend to do is rationalize it. Mm -hmm say, oh, yes, this is the best decision because, you know, London is a great, diverse place and, you know, Paris is not that great because I don't speak the language. So you downgrade the one that you rejected and you kind of upgrade the one that you actually um, selected. Now, once you can't, once you arrive in London and start your job, well, that's a whole different story because, you know, then you actually have evidence and, you know, do I like it, do I don't like it? But at the moment of making the choice and sometimes after, um, you would have this thing where you, you kind of rationalize your choice. Now, when I say rationalize, I don't necessarily mean that it has to be an effortful or even uh, something that you're aware of. Mm -hmm. This um, seems to be an automatic process um, that most of the time you're not aware of, I would say. But it's also a process that seems to be pretty irrational, right? Because if you don't have any new information about, say, the Paris job, thinking that it's a bad deal or thinking that it's a worse option than London doesn't, doesn't seem to make any sense, right? Well, the new evidence comes from inside, or at least you highlight ah, it. Yes. And that's one of the cool things about your work is you're showing how, how processing in the reward areas of our brain can actually change the evidence we pick up, right? Yeah. So I think what happens is um, that, you know, once you pick the London, you try and think of new evidence or at mm. least you know, bring the evidence into awareness. So, um, so maybe before you kind of didn't think about Paris, it's like, you know, you don't speak the language, you didn't, it wasn't in the front of your mind, but now you're kind of bringing it up. Um, and yeah, what we find is that um, when we did a study where we had people uh, making choices between vacation destinations, mm -hmm. hypothetical choices, so this is something that we have to do, you know, hopefully, <laughs> have to do every year. Um, so you're kind of like, where should I go? Should I go to Thailand? Should I go to Greece? I mean, this is a good problem to have. Um, so... Um, what we did is we had people imagine going to vacation in all different destinations. So now imagine yourself in Greece, imagine yourself in Thailand. Um, and also tell us, you know, how happy are you going to be if you go there? And what we found is that um, a region of the brain um, called the striatum, so part of the striatum, which is kind of deep in our brain, which is related to reward processing, um, this region seemed to, activity in that region correlated with how happy you thought you were going to be if you go to Greece or Thailand while well, you imagine it. Then what we did, we made people um, make really difficult choices between things that they rated the same. You're like, uh, you know, I'm going to be from a scale to one to seven, I'll be happy in Greece five, I'll be happy in Thailand five. So it's a different, it's a difficult choice. It's like, okay, you have to make a choice. Um, what we found is that that signal in the striatum 
could predict the choice that you made. So if the signal was higher for Thailand than Greece, even so you rated them the same, you're more likely to choose Thailand. Right? So the idea is that the signal in the striata might be more accurately predicting what people's preferences are than their ratings. Yeah, that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. And after that, what we did, we had to imagine all the things again. So now you took Thailand, and now again, okay, imagine Thailand again, imagine Greece again, rate them again. Um, and, you know, what we found is what people have found before, that once you chose Thailand, you rate that higher and you rate slower. But what was new is that also activity in your state changed. So now the uh, signal in the, in the stratum for Thailand went up and for Greece went down, suggesting that you really changed um, your preference and your expectations um, and, you know, your biology, your, your stratum was showing that as well. That's cool. But it's not, the neat thing is that it's not just the changes in the positive direction. Like if you choose Thailand, it's not just that your striatum activation for Thailand goes up, like, oh, now I'm going to go to Thailand. It's also that your striatum activation for the rejected thing goes down too. And we've actually done another study where we had you make tough decisions between negative events. So let's say you have some kind of medical condition and um, you have different options of, of medication. All of them have, you know, negative symptoms that you have to make a decision. So you're deciding between something bad and something bad. Um, how do you do that? So again, we had people imagine all kinds of medical conditions, headache, um, break your arm and so on. Um, and again, part of the stratum, it was a different part, part of the stratum was signaling how how bad you thought that was going to be. And again, we gave you a difficult choice between two things that you thought were bad to the same degree. Now, um, you made a choice. So, you know, this is hypothetical. It sounds a bit ridiculous, but, you know, we chose something like we said, okay, would you rather have a headache or a stomach ache? So you're like, I'd rather have a headache. So now when you imagine headache, um, you rate it as not as bad. You know, and the stomach ache, which you decided I'd really rather not have, goes up. Um, and same thing in the striatum. The signal in the striatum, it's with a different part of the patamen, changed according to um, what you chose. So the signal there, again, was affected by the choices that you made. That's cool. So it suggests that the act of choosing is doing some important work for what our preferences are. Um, but one of your other studies suggests that it, the act of choosing can be pretty illusory to still get the same effect, right? Because um, you've also shown that you don't have to really be making a choice to sort of see these cascading effects down the line. You just have to think you made a choice. Yeah, so it doesn't really matter if you, you made the choice as long as you think you made it. Um, so what we did is we um, told people that we're showing them the options really, really fast. So they won't be able to consciously see the words Greece and Thailand, but it will be there and they need to make a choice between Greece and Thailand, although the, the, they won't see the words. And only after they make the choice, they will see what they had chosen. So they think they chose Thailand, but really it was all random. And we found the same thing. Preference for the one you chose goes up, and for the one you didn't um, goes down. Um, and, you know, you've, you've seen very similar things looking at primates. Mm -hmm. um, I think they made a choice. And I think what this means is, I mean, I, for example, if you take um, – if you fly and you take a plane, at the end, when you arrive at your destination, often um, the pilot will say, thank you for choosing this airline. So they're kind of emphasizing the fact that you made the choice, even if you didn't make the choice. You know, someone else booked the flight for you. They're like, oh, I chose blah, blah, blah. That means it's pretty good, and I should probably select it again. That's awesome. And do we know anything about the boundary conditions of what counts as a choice? I mean, this is something we've been interested in in, in studying monkey choice too, right, is – can I just tell you you made a choice? Does that work as well? Does, you know, if you made it, if you really made a different choice, but I mess with you? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I don't remember the results now, but I do think that there's some studies on it from, um, from Brown. I don't remember. So we've never done, we've never done actually having to make an action to make a choice versus mm -hmm not making an action at all or, you know, um, I think it's important that you believe you made the choice. That's probably important um, to some degree. Mm -hmm. cool. but you've also been doing some work recently to show how powerful these effects are, right? Because I think one criticism of this work has been, well, you, you know, people are sitting in this fMRI scanner, or they're choosing between vacations that they're never really going to take. How long lasting does making this sort of really random choice affect your preferences down the line, right? Do your subjects leave and really love Thailand and hate Paris or, or whatever the comparison is? Yeah, so we had uh, people come back three years later. To wow, see. that's a long study. <laughs> well, it was, 
I have to admit, we, it's not wasn't planned. We just had subjects do the study, and then three years later, the students were still around. So we were like, well, it was it will be cool for them to come back and and you know, see what happens to the preference. Now, the good thing about our study was that you know most of them didn't actually go. There's 80 different destinations. It's not that they so they didn't really experience these things. So I think if you experience the um, different events that might uh, contaminate the results, but they didn't most, you know, and so they'd come back and, and we'd be like, well, you know, how happy will you be to go to Thailand or Greece and so on? And they, we found that the effects were remained after those um, three years. Wow. So the, so it really is the case that whatever this process is, even if it's changing it fast, but the changes that we see are pretty long lasting. So it's not just that it changes, uh, these changes in striatum quickly affect your preferences, but they're long-lasting effects on preferences that you see down the line. That seems to be the case. Um, now, there's, it's unclear. We don't know exactly what the process is. So one thought is, I kind of mentioned it before, that when you see Thailand on its own, you might think of, you know, beach sun. You see Greece on its own, you think of beach sun. But when I put Thailand and Greece next to each other, then suddenly the difference are highlighted and you think, well, I'd rather go to Greece because that's actually a shorter flight. Um, mm -hmm. So you kind of highlight the, the differences. And then once you did that, that actually might be a way to update what you think about Greece. So the next time we have to rate Greece, you might actually think about that again. Or it might be automatic, in which case the value already goes up and you don't need to go through this process. Or it might be that this attribute is something that comes up again. Mm -hmm. But yet again, it does seem like when we're seeking out the evidence, we're seeking out evidence that supports our, our choice, however illusory or random or ill-fated that choice might have been. Absolutely. And it seems to be much less a case when someone makes a choice for us. And that's kind of obvious when they say, okay, you know, when our partner says we're going to go to Greece, um, then you're like, huh, it doesn't necessarily enhance your, your preferences at that point. So you have to choice yourself. So I guess the key is to just really be worrying, really be thinking that you're making your own choices yourself, um, even for some of the bad things in your life. I think you've chosen them. And control is really important for optimism. So, I mean, one of the key reasons that we think that people are optimistic is that people have um, an illusory perception of their own control. So people tend to think they have more control in their life than they actually do. And that is, on average, a good thing, because that means if I have control of my life, I can steer the wheel in the right direction. And if I can steer the wheel in the right direction, well, the future will be bright. Um, and there's a very tight correlation between how much control you think you have and how optimistic you are. And that is one of the problems in depression, because depressed individuals tend to think they don't have as much control. Um, so some of the studies uh, in depression, um, there's a term called um, depressive realism, and, and that's based on, on some of these studies showing that they have actually more accurate perception of control. Some of these studies are, are somewhat controversial, but I, I think in general, um, it does show that mild depressed individuals have more accurate perception of their control, and it's not necessarily a good thing most of the time. So thinking about what might be a good thing, you know, if you were giving people some prescriptive advice about what level to set their optimism at or um, how, to, how to either be more realistic or be optimistic, like what would you suggest people do? Like should we work to try to find the right level of optimism? Is it better to be optimistic than accurate? Like what's your, what's your sense? Well, I, first of all, it is, I mean, I think the studies definitely show that it's better to be um, optimistic. Mm -hmm. Mild optimism is best. Um, now, can you change your level of optimism? I'm not sure. It's very difficult. So first of all, it, the good news is that most of us do have this optimal level of optimism. Um, so that's good. So most of us don't really need to change. What we do need to do is um, become aware of our optimism. Because if we become aware of our optimism, we don't necessarily change the optimism. It's a bit like a visual illusion. So you look, you, a visual illusion, you know, it kind of fools you. And even if you know it's a visual illusion, it's still there. So it doesn't change your illusion. But then what you could do is you can take steps to um, and actions to kind of protect yourself. So, you know, in a car, things look closer than they seem in the mirror, but, you know, being aware of it means that you can take a little bit more time before you turn and, and so on. Same thing with optimism. Being aware that we have this illusion doesn't mean that we won't have it, but it does mean that we can tell ourselves, okay, well, I'm not going to be sick, but 
there is this bias and I'm going to go to the doctor anyway. And, and this works or, you know, putting your budget together. So people tend to underestimate the cost of things and they tend to think the project will um, last, um, be shorter than they end up taking them. And so you can correct for these things. Now, when it comes to people with depression, that's where you really want to work um, on the way you perceive um the world and you know some of the cognitive behavioral therapy are, are based on this it's how you um, you perceive the events that happened to you whether you had control don't have control and that changes your optimism so the idea would be for those of us who are not depressed what we should do is not try to change our optimism but try to have a lot of very explicit sort of system two indicators of like real risk and real bad consequences and having both of those will allow us to do better yeah. It's really tricky because it's a bit of a balance because, for example, you know, I said people tend to underestimate how long things will take. Um, so it's been shown that, you know, if academics go home on the weekend and they take eight projects, maybe they'll do four or five. But if you take home four projects, you're going to do three. So it's good to have this bias to some extent. Um, so it's kind of a kind of a balance. But I, think, I think in principle, yes, being aware means that you can take these kind of extra actions to correct yourself. And so the last question, has all this research made you more optimistic or more accurate? Have you changed around doing all this work? It's really a tough question. Um, it's, first of all, because you're not aware of your own optimism, it's really hard to kind of introspect because um, mostly your introspection is going to be wrong. Um, I think the other thing that happened in the last... I guess how many years since I started studying this quite a bit I've also become older and so now I'm the peak of the less optimistic <laughs> so I don't know if it's studying optimism or just age uh, I, I do at the beginning maybe I, I do it to some extent I do try to correct myself so at least in the first few years I, I put a helmet on when I rode the bike I have to say I don't do that as much but I do try to correct myself um, and take extra caution at, at some times well, well, thank you for this fantastic discussion. I can be very optimistic that folks will enjoy it. Um, but everyone should check out uh, Tali's book um, and her TED Talk if you want to hear more about this stuff.